Thanks, everybody, and welcome, Craig. Um, so we're going to get kicked off here, uh, have about half an hour to cover uh, communications infrastructure, strategic and investment perspectives. We've got a go good broad uh, set of uh, CEOs representing a number of different geographies. And why don't we kick it off uh, with Tony, uh, and then Andrew, Steve, and then Craig. Um, give us a little bit of an update on recent operational milestones, um, um, geographic footprint, and uh, anything else you care to highlight, uh, and then we'll uh, dive into some more topics. Sure. Tony Rasabi, uh, CEO of Recovery Point. Um, Craig, it's good to see you in Australia. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, the, and the background looks really awesome. So uh, we have two data centers actually today looking to expand. We have two. Uh, they're both in Maryland, Gaithersburg, and um, Germantown. And then we have, uh, we actually utilize a few others uh, where we lease space. Uh, in Mount Prospect, but our focus is really around the services base. Uh, it's really around mainframe backup, and um, we supplement it with, uh, with co-location. And then lastly, we have an automation layer that we just acquired a company about three months ago that is uh, called BPR, Business Process Resiliency. So looking forward to talking about uh, where we're making our next investments in the space. Excellent. Andrew, welcome. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Andrew Schaap, CEO of Aligned Data Centers, uh, currently in six markets in North America. Inside those six markets, uh, north of 10 buildings, uh, you'll see us uh, drop in, uh, a pin on the map in a couple of new markets this year, uh, certainly. Uh, doubling down in the markets that we already serve, we're real pleased with those markets, uh, performing really well for us, as well as several new markets. Uh, we primarily focus on uh, large-scale, hyperscale type deployments, so most of our sites are, call it uh, 70 to 180 megawatt type deployments, so large-scale. Uh, and then, uh, but, but again, we focus on uh, you know, the, the large clients that uh, have those large scale requirements and needs. In addition to that, we've got uh, kind of a solution that we've got intellectual property wrapped around that creates uh, kind of high dense environments. Um, so contrary to public opinion, uh, density is actually starting to happen now. We've been talking about it for 15 years and we're starting to see clients that are actually deploying now at 20, 30, 40 kW rack and the solution that uh, Align deploys has the ability to flex up to that type of density. Steve, CEO of Zao. Awesome, John. Hi there, Steve Smith. I've uh, been at Zao now 15 months. I'm in my 15th month. <coughs> Craig, good to see you. Um, you, you. We're sorry you didn't make the trip. Um, I work with Craig. I'm on Craig's board down in Australia, and it's uh, we have a good time uh, building that next chapter. But at Zao, we're going through a transformation after 15 and a half years and 46 acquisitions. Um, was a most people that knew the company became the largest independent fiber provider in the U.S. in about 350 markets and about 50 markets in Europe. So it's uh, a very large-scale network that is uh, going through a change now for the next chapter. And most of the stuff we've been working on, we have a new operating model, we have a new leadership team, and we're, uh, we've been private since March of 20, right when COVID hit. So that was a real wonderful time, and I've been virtual my entire time transitioning in here, so it's, uh, it's been quite a journey. And Craig, welcome virtually. Thanks, John. It's good to see you guys. Um, sorry I couldn't be there with you. Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in isolation this week myself, so <laughs> having my own little COVID party. Um, yeah, so uh, Craig Scroggy, CEO of uh, Next DC. Uh, so John has been a big year in the last year, uh, despite COVID. A significant amount going on from a development point of view. So we do everything from uh, hyperscale enterprise government right through now to uh, building out an edge network of data centers as well. So on average, we're investing just over half a billion a year on a run rate basis in, in new developments in data centers. Um, we cover every major market in Australia. A um, couple of big uh, announcements in the last 12 months. Um, our third site in Melbourne, a uh, new, new uh, development there, 150 megawatts uh, to add to the, the first two sites. And then in Sydney, acquired our fourth site uh, for a new 300 megawatt uh, development there. So a couple of big pieces and, and the team uh, very focused on, on um, executing our uh, expansion plans uh, for Asia this year. Um, COVID has been difficult for travel, obviously, and uh, a lot of focus on, on picking up our first um, land acquisitions in, in a number of markets in Asia so that we can grow the platform there. Thanks, John. Yeah, and uh, maybe sticking with you, Craig, uh, you, you, you kind of quantified a little bit uh, some, some of the expansion plans that your company has, uh, is pursuing. Um, as you look at the overall Australian market, um, what, are, what are we seeing in terms of uh, absorption? Um, what's driving that? 
Um, is it primarily Sydney, Melbourne? How would you kind of describe um, the growth vectors and how they're changing in, uh, in Australia? Yeah, well, the country is largely, uh, the GDP predominantly sits between the Sydney and Melbourne markets. It's a very mature market, so we're in our uh, second and third wave of, of hyperscale deployments. That's been more than 10 years or, or essentially 10 years now uh, since we started, John, and, and we uh, helped our customers in the very first cloud deployments in the region. Uh, so quite a mature business in that regard, but not mature in the context of where the industry is going. It's still obviously very, very early. Now, the size and scale of the deployments um, are going to be uh, size appropriate relative to the region, but we're still seeing five, 10 plus megawatt single orders for customers. Uh, and the total market now in, in Sydney and Melbourne, you've seen you know, hundreds of megawatts of, of uh, pipeline being uh, developed. And um, I, I think that that uh, reflects the significant um, uh, rate of growth and the early adopter nature of the, of the region. The other thing that we're seeing that's interesting is really the, the second wave, the hyper challenges, the, the next players that are growing up and want to be hyperscalers. And for many of those, um, my friends there uh, in the US uh, that are familiar with having a long tail of, of larger um, uh, infrastructure builders, uh, we haven't had, that's not been the case uh, in, in Asia. And we're starting to see, you know, that long riders um, make commitments to the region, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, Andrew, Andrew made a comment about density. I'm going to stick with you, Craig. So Andrew, Andrew made a comment about uh, density matters and what are you seeing in terms of uh, um, the cloud and other, other hyperscalers and, and the nature of what they are uh, requiring of companies like yourself? Yeah, well, for, for most hyperscale clients, um, the density is, is what you would expect uh, in, in terms of improved economics, you know, a larger amount of capacity in a smaller amount of space. Uh, the pleasing thing is that as we see um, this really driving change in our data center designs, it's actually having uh, quite a positive impact on the enterprise. So where, whilst you would expect that level of technology innovation to be driven in the hyperscale um, customers, given their depth and experience in these areas, and a lot of them are developing their own technology in this space, starting to see a lot more enterprise customers focus on getting better value for money um, really driving a greater return on investment. And that means that they are uh, deploying much denser technology than they have in the past. And they're uh, recycling a lot of that uh, wasted space or lowly, um, you know, underutilized space and, and making those investments that they need to make to get a better return on their investment. Um, so, Tony, maybe over to you, if you could maybe talk a little bit about your product mix. It's a little bit different than what Andrew and, and Craig have, but what... Uh, um, what are customers demanding? Are you noticing the nature of, of the growth change at Recovery Point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, COVID has actually been, um, I hate to say this, but it's actually been good for the business um, because more and more folks are looking at backup. It be, resiliency is becoming a huge issue. And actually, it's been sort of a two, uh, two-fold uh, area of focus for us. One has been, how do you mitigate ransomware, which has been uh, our customer bases. We're about 330 customers partially uh, federal and state government, um, healthcare, uh, banking, financial insurance, and what they're, and it's all large enterprise. So the focus has really been about resiliency um, in this whole process and ransomware. And our product set is we lead with recovery, and there's even more of a niche focus for a product set. It's actually backup for mainframe, which uh, surprisingly most folks think it's going away. But uh, in 2021, there was a $4.8 billion increase in mainframe spend. Um, it's stable. It's a stable environment. So we kind of see that. The, the real big trend that we're seeing is the amount of capacity, and Steve and I were talking about this earlier, that's being, uh, that's going into the enterprises today. I mean, I'm look, I, five years ago, there was sort of a fast E that was acquired for, a, for connectivity. Today, it's all 10 gig waves for enterprises, which is enormous amount of capacity. I mean, that used to be the carrier intake. So I think what we're seeing is the actual fiber capacity for the amount of traffic that's being passed is going to continue. Uh, we just received a bid uh, for uh, an RFP for a uh, pharmaceutical uh, group that is looking for 100 gig of capacity in and out of our facility. So I think with the trending that we're seeing is 
the amount of traffic and capacity that's going to continue to grow. So for us, that's great. Um, and it's, you know, what we call MIPS, which are on the uh, um, Z15 uh, uh, IBM mainframe service that we use. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, it's complete shift for me in terms of what I used to do, which was interconnection. Um, and uh, so it is interesting. But the enterprises are driving a huge amount of business that, you know, we didn't really see this in the, in the past. I think it's going to be fairly big shift. Um, so I want to kind of continue down the path of asking about product capabilities that are either on your roadmap or that you're finding uh, where there's surprising amounts of demand. Perhaps, Steve, on the, uh, on, on the fiber side of things, um, networking that Tony mentioned, the, the, the volume of bandwidth needed, um, SD-WAN, SDN. What, uh, what, is it, what do things look like at Zao? Are you pr primarily focused on existing products or are there new things that you're either revamping or, or developing? Well, there's a, like I said, we're, you know, this is 15 years into a journey here with, with a roll-up of a lot of companies, and so there was a lot of capability that was acquired uh, along the way that was, you know, packet, fiber, packet, optical capabilities, and so there's upgrading of that network that's going on now with the next generation. Um, we just did an acquisition of an SD-WAN uh, player that was uh, kind of a boutique player that some I'd never heard of before we started studying the market. We had, when I got there, we, had a, we knew that the SD-WAN capability needed to be upgraded, so we could either build or buy it. We decided it, buying it was going, to be, was going to be a quicker solution. And so this company's down out of Irvine, California. It's about 110, 115 people. It's almost an aqua hire. So there's, these, are install, these people that are doing SD-WAN today on 30,000 instances with VMware, going to, or 20 going to 30,000. Um, they deploy all over the place, uh, and it's a managed service capability. So, in our world, just like, just like Andrew and Tony's world, everything's going software defined. The network's going to be software defined. So this is, as everybody knows, Ethernet and MPLS are tailing off. So, so SD-WAN is a capability we have to have much deeper. And so that was our first big new, first capability acquisition, too, that Zell's ever done. Every other acquisition we did was to buy fiber or waves capability. So that was a new twist for us. But, you know, we're still chasing the same trends. These guys, are, it's, it, every company we talk to is, has a digital agenda. Every company we talk to is trying to adopt the cloud in different formats. Uh, every company we talk to needs more network density and more, more unique routes to run their business. Um, and then software defined everything is, is, is in almost every conversation we have. Um, so you, me you, me you mentioned acquisitions of, of various stripes. Um, where are we in, in the US and Europe, which are the two theaters where you operate um, around industry consolidation? And as a company, are there? Um, um, you know, parts of your footprint that you may wish to augment more than others. Well, John knows it well in the data center space, and <laughs> you know, I was fortunate enough to be part of a consolidation journey uh, over the last decade. So I believe uh, that the fiber business is going to is going to consolidate at a at a at a more rapid level than it has in the past. So I think you'll see us become very active in Europe. Uh, I think there's an opportunity to consolidate in Europe. Um, our objective here is we're the largest U.S. independent fiber player with other services around it. Uh, our journey over the next five to seven years uh, with our two new owners will be to put platform Zale further around the world. So I think Europe will be most immediate. I think we'll push into Asia. Um, you'll see us do tuck-ins in the U.S. for capability. Um, and uh, where we have gaps in the network or capacity constraints in our network it could be an area that we could also acquire. We've also, uh, we, we have a new strategy that the previous regime, and I'm, I've been good friends with Dan Crusoe for a long time, so we built a heck of a company with assets that are incredible. Um, but we never did go take advantage of all the lit on and near net buildings that we've accumulated with all those acquisitions. So we have close to 40,000 buildings that we have that were on or near net with fiber. And we never really sold more services on top of those locations. So that's a new strategy for our company that we've never done in the previous years. We're calling it regional network sales. And we're going to go out and cut. We're doing six pilots this year to go out and try to see if we can put more capability on top of those on and near net locations and sell into them. Hmm. Um, so that's a, new, that's a new alternate revenue stream for the company as we go forward. Um, and then, Craig, uh, maybe over to you. Um, you, know, there, you do have a networking product uh, across, uh, across your footprint. Um, <coughs> bare metal, managed services, to what degree do you see things uh, changing as you continue your growth uh, in, in the Australian enterprise market? As a service, ultimately, is the goal today, John. 
Um, there's no question uh, that this is an area that customers are continuing to find uh, complexity and making it simple for customers, reducing friction as it relates to being able to consume a multiplicity of services is the ultimate goal. Um, as far as our uh, continued investment in these areas, uh, building out that network capability, we own our own metro fibre between the sites. Uh, for some time, it's been important to allow our customers to treat um, multiple locations as a single campus, doesn't matter where they are. Uh, that gets more challenging as you um, go between states and go between countries. Uh, but the product has to continue to evolve. And I think um, Steve's point is a, is, is a great one. And that is that we, we too also have um, thousands of services where we're not providing the customer any additional start to continue to invest in the product portfolio. You'll see us adding more services on top of those uh, existing um, network as a service um, that we provide to clients today. So this is unquestionably an area where, um, you know, share of wallet and, and your ability to be able to continue to invest will drive um, a higher level of revenue per user. Um, and then Andrew, anything to kind of add? A, a lot of themes that may not necessarily apply to Aligned, but uh, you know, you're obviously growing at a very fast rate. Um, product footprint, what, what, what are, what's kind of is driving your growth strategy yeah. going forward? <clears throat> Sure, I, I, maybe I'll change the uh, tact a little bit since I probably can't add anything on telecommunications that these gentlemen have already really hit the ball out of the park on. Um, when, when we look at strategy, um, one of the things that we really focus on is uh, just continued innovation. And innovation in data centers is probably one of the things that's overlooked because people think, oh, it's a building, it's got generators, it's UPSs, what else can you do with it? Uh, but we're really pushing the edge and really trying to push into um, things like production, not construction, less labor on site, uh, building more in the factory and then delivering on site. It gives us nimbleness, it gives us speed, it gives us uh, QA, QC, quality assurance in the product. Um, but in addition to that, innovation doesn't just end with you know, the product. Um, so we look at ESG, for example, as part, an area that we can innovate on and be a kind of a, a market leader in it for the data center space. And so last year we did uh, you know, inaugural um, uh, sustainable length financing of a billion, uh, just over a billion. Uh, it was the first one that was done in the United States. Uh, we kind of continue that kind of innovation around ESG to try and be a market leader on that because innovation can't, shouldn't just be on products, it should be on the approach that we have as a company, should make sure we're aligned, aligned with our clients. Sorry not to use our brand name in that, but we, we, we tend to do that a little bit too much in our shop. Uh, but really being aligned with our clients and what they're trying to achieve and sustainability ESG initiatives, DNI, things like that, that really make uh, that you know that are core to our DNA and core to our thinking, um, really resonates with the client base and helps again help helps with what Craig said, you know, attain hopefully a larger share of wallet. Um, so I think we are going to have time for audience questions. If there are any, please uh, make yourself visible, um, and I'll uh, call on you time time permitting. Um, Want to want to maybe ask about joint ventures? Um, some of them have been announced in Australia, Craig. Uh, you know, am amongst your peer set, and then you've articulated your own growth strategy into bigger and bigger sites within Australia, and then you mentioned kind of rest of Asia. But um, um, how do you kind of see that landscape unfolding? Um, uh, you know, as a, both an observer and, and perhaps as a potential participant. Yeah, look, this is moving at an extraordinary rate. Um, I mean, we, we, as a business, you know, on a run rate, sort of half a billion a year in CapEx invested, um, you know, we raised uh, two and a half billion in uh, senior secured debt last year and had, um, you know, raised a billion in, in equity uh, a year prior to that. Um, you know, the option uh, today, I mean, the, the, the universe of sovereign wealth funds and, and other uh, investors has never been, we've never seen, um, you know, the level of appetite that we see today. Um, the, uh, I guess the, the key for us, John, is, um, you know, when you look at acquisition opportunities and joint venture in Asia, uh, the quality of the product really doesn't exist. The reason you don't see um, the level of M&A activity in Asia that you would in, in the US or Europe is just the quality of businesses don't exist. They generally really have to be built out um, so no question, you know, we've seen an unprecedented level of inbound uh, interest for us um, to partner with people who have got significant capital to deploy, uh, and the opportunity is certainly there to do it. So, 
it's very fluid. Um, we have an opportunity to consider that with our S4 development that will be in the you know, 300 megawatts in the order of three plus billion. Um, but that's not the only development. Obviously, there's hundreds of megawatts in multiple countries uh, to be addressed. And, and I think that will be you know, continue to be a, a very, very active area um, investment in Asia uh, from those sources is, is at a level I've never seen in the last decade. So, Steve, as a board member of NextDC, how would you kind of rate uh, Craig's performance as a, as a CEO? <laughs> I, I, I haven't believed anything he said so far. No, I'm just kidding. Craig, Craig, is, Craig is one of the, uh, actually, we've been friends for a long time, and he, it is a bigger challenge, as he said. I think his, his appetite and his capability could, if he was in the U.S., he, he would have been doing joint ventures and acquisitions at a very high rate. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tougher in Asia. And, um, but we had a lot of fun together trying to figure out how to steer the company to the, you know, to the next chapter. And um, he's got eyes and ears all over Asia. And you know, at some point, you know, building a pan-Asian you know, uh, strategy is, it will probably unfold. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. It's a great board, and it's a great team, and it's a, it's a great product. I, it was actually pretty funny when I first walked into the first data center and said, I kind of recognize these. They look kind of similar to what I came from. <laughs> so he built a heck of a company and added a few other features to it that differentiated it, which I thought was, you know, having never been able to go inside until now as a board member, it's been, he, he runs a great company that has a great product and a great culture. Um, audience questions. <laughs> None for now. So, so a Andrew, maybe, maybe back to you. Um, you know, ag aggressive expansion. How have things uh, been pacing in terms of uh, permitting, construction timelines, long lead time items, pace of customer movements? We all hear about supply chain constraints and the impacts of COVID on this industry. How has it affected customer behavior? How has it affected your ability to expand in line with uh, your your growth objectives? Yeah, I, and there's, uh, I mean, there's a. a Depending on the client base, depending on the sophistication of the client, and, their, and how how in the market they are, uh, I think I think it's safe to say that real sophisticated clients are, are well aware of supply chain challenges, jurisdictional jurisdictional challenges, as well as like utility challenges. Some of the markets that we think of as top tier markets, um, both in the states and Europe, um, are are getting uh, quite scarce on utility, and uh, substations. You know. So, Current, current timeline for a big transformer now can be two to three years. And uh, so there's, there's some significant challenges that are uh, taking place. In addition to that, just like permitting, going into the local jurisdictions and things like that, like that, some of the markets that we serve, even in the states where you traditionally see very quick turnaround on development, like sub, sub 12 months um, from scratching the dirt to completed product, uh, it's, it's a little bit more um, extended now just due to just approval time pr frames. Are people in the office? Are they not in the office? Um, so certain markets uh, we're, we're definitely seeing some challenges on, um, which really um, kind of forces providers like ourselves to be thoughtful, to afford invest, um, to have essentially sophisticated, thoughtful capital stacks um, that are willing to like, kind of put that capital out knowing that it's going to take more time and energy to get the return on that capital. Um, and that's, I think all of us you know, have that challenge where we talk to our board members and our capital stacks to make, make sure that they're aware of like, we're going to have to spend a little bit more money, a little bit faster, um, to get product up and out of the ground. Because clients today, um, like Craig said, uh, clients today um, really aren't going to wait um, for product. Uh, so all of us have to kind of have build product and get it out there in the marketplace. Um, so we're we're definitely trying to lead lead with some innovation on that side. Again, um, you know, forward invest in supply chain, forward invest in some innovation that we have around um, production, not construction, as I mentioned earlier, um, and then uh, trying to kind of you know, avoid those challenges that are, I think we're all going to face, whether we're, you know, you know, getting, getting a easement for a fiber line or uh, for me getting a permit for generators in a, in a jurisdiction that may be challenged with particulates and sound attenuation and things like that. Audience question, please. Hi. Avi Friedman with Kentech. So I guess a question, you know, you talked about capital availability. Uh, Steve, you talked about having buildings as an asset. Historically, um, people looked often at the infrastructure space, um, not, you know, it was a limited set of investors and people were concerned about it. And so there's this concern about, let's go up the stack, let's get out of CapEx jail where our return is capped by, you know, how many dollars we put into CapEx. Um, but there's a wide ability to invest, um, you know, in infrastructure now. So I'm curious how people think about um, doing more of the infrastructure that 
makes us all you know, go during COVID versus uh, some of the historic you know, thinking about going up stack and owning even more of an enterprise spend for everybody. Craig, if you caught the question, I'll let you take the first shot at that. I did. Um, yeah, look, uh, that's that's probably the, the history of the last 10 years. You know, when we started, uh, there were few investors. The rate of return was high. Tony could tell a great story about uh, Telex uh, here as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, I won't steal his thunder. I'll, I'll let him do that. And, and Steve can as well in the context of the Equinix history. But if you look at return expectations, our focus, you know, when we started was on enterprise and government high, high return on invested capital, thousands of clients, tens of thousands of network connections, a highly diverse business. And, and whilst it may still have been predominantly data center services, power, uh, UPS, security, uh, access and network, um, that will continue to evolve. And ultimately companies grow and develop because they grow with their customers. Um, you know, we, we still want to stay in our lane and, and be the best at what we do, but it doesn't matter that we, it doesn't mean that we, we, we shouldn't and, and won't continue to invest in areas that our customers need us to grow uh, to make that frictionless, um, you know, seamless uh, technology adoption uh, service for them. So John, the, the uh, margin and return expectations continue to change as more capital flows to the, the industry. Um, a lot has changed in the last decade. So, you know, there's 10 times more capital. The return expectations may be a little lower given the, the volume of, of hyperscale business out there, but the AAA rated um, nature of, of that capital means that, you know, it can, it can return uh, lower um, relative to uh, its risk profile. Um, but the opportunity also exists to, to grow greater services and grow your gross margin line by continuing. I think the, the comment is true and, and there's more capital and uh, there's more mixed capital, but return expectations, um, you know, I guess from our perspective, uh, whilst returns may change because cost of capital comes down. Uh, Andrew's point before John as well is, is a really valid one. And that is, when you build more in the factory, you innovate more in development and design, you use more renewable energy, reduce your carbon footprint, you become more efficient. There's just a lot of business benefits in all those things. So there may be pressure on, on the cost of capital and, and the rate of returns, um, but there's a lot of innovation going in the industry that's um, putting positive pressure uh, on the other side of that. So I think Andrew's examples were, were very good and we're doing the same thing. So I'm going to end with a question about sort of convergence. Um, you know, we have a, a fiber company represented and then various flavors of data center and, and uh, kind of up the stack services around recovery. Um, to what extent um, do you see consolidation across these sectors? We had Mark Gansey at the keynote, uh, you know, kind of articulate a little bit around that. Um, how does that affect your strategic views? And we'll just kind of go, go down um, the, the line here and that'll uh, wrap up our final two minutes of this panel. Yeah, I think, you know, it's no, we've seen over the last even, what, 90 days, there's been massive consolidation and some big uh, companies acquired, <laughs> you know, so we're going to continue to see it. But one of the things I want to pick up on what Steve said is software is going to be a crucial component of where we're going. Um, we acquired a software company for that matter um, to continue. We're going to be actually, our, from a trending perspective, we're going to be infrastructure light and software heavy um, from a go forward, and that's actually our model. Um, and focus on sort of, so obviously your question earlier, we're gonna, we're actually not gonna delve into spending more money on infrastructure, we're gonna do it on dev ops, um, and that's kind of where we're going from, from our go forward. So we continue, from, from our perspective, we're gonna look at those types of assets as opposed to the infrastructure piece. Andrew. Uh, why, don't, why don't I just mix it up a little bit and take a contrarian view. I think consolidation in the data center space will, will stop. Um, no, slow down, stop. Um, why would you ever want to sell an asset that you get past escape velocity and your yields are good, your returns are good, and the capital is flowing in? You would, I mean, the goal would be perpetual capital, stay in it. Um, I think, yeah, Mark, Mark said something very interesting that I think the three of us heard that, you know, the sophistication of private capital, I think right now is exceeding the public capital markets. Um, they get more. They have more time to spend time understanding the digital infrastructure economy, the landscape, the stickiness of the assets, the stickiness of the clients. Um, so, you know, what you know, the, the the idea of consolidation 
in my mind, um, why would anybody want to sell an asset once you get past kind of the escape velocity and you start uh, really achieving good success and yields and returns with access to capital like, like we all are seeing in the marketplace today? Um, so I, I, would, I would probably contend that you, you might, you're, you're going to see changing of hands, but I don't think you're going to see the traditional M&A um, to the same scale, especially with some of the folks who are you know, at, at, at scale um, in, in the business. Uh, and, and with, again, it all depends on the capital stack. Um, but you know, again, if you're sitting with infrastructure capital or, or sovereign wealth or folks like that, they're going to want to stay in those assets and continue to get those returns. Um, as long as they don't have LP challenges. <laughs> so, Steve, putting on your former Equinix hat and uh, uh, the CEO, CFO of American Tower, current CEO, was on your board at Equinix, so you saw American Tower buy Coresight. Was that, uh, is that the type of thing we can continue to expect in the future, tower and data center convergence? Yeah, I think we're going to see a little bit of both. I think you're going to see, you know, before I showed up at Zale, we shedded, or right, right as I showed up, we shedded 50 data centers that they had accumulated. That was a, you know, a decision made by the investors. I, you know, um, so we could focus on the core business, which you know, now that I'm inside there, I think has been, it was a really good decision, and it's you know, focus and prioritization is a key advantage. But um, you know, when when you're a tower company and you can spend ten billion dollars on a on an asset that can give you a little more intelligence about the edge and about interconnection, it tells you something about what they're thinking about, right? As a tower company, mm -hmm. so I, I yeah, I think we'll see more interesting plays like that. I think you'll see other companies shedding assets because they need to focus on the core business. Um, and and the, a quick comment on the capital, it, it has been pretty amazing to me having been inside of a public company at Equinix for over a decade and then raising capital for a private, ec for an infrastructure fund and now being inside of a privatized uh, infrastructure asset, Zao. The amount of money out there, as Craig said, is just amazing. So for years, we all were surrounded by the private equity returns in the 20s, you know, and up. <laughs> then then, then that, that same money from those same LPs identified these stabilized assets called infrastructure assets, towers, data centers, wireless companies, and said, eh, if you can give me a mid-teens return, well, well that, uh, that's good enough for me. And these are stabilized assets, right? Recurring revenue, big customers, long-term contracts. And so it became a whole new category. And all this money got raised, and all these new funds called infrastructure funds that weren't even around a decade ago have appeared. And now it's going down one layer below that to core investing, which is a high single-digit returns. Mm -hmm for these same investors for a different type of asset, you know, a wholesale plus hyperscale investment. So I, who knows where this is going to go, but it's, there's plenty of money, there's <laughs> plenty of opportunity for everybody in this industry to go continue to build value. Um, and if you like this business, it's just, I mean, there's, watching the, the dynamics of the people who have been in and around these industries, they all know each other, they all are successful people. Um, this is a great, great industry we participate in. We're very fortunate. Uh, Craig, you get the last word, and you can feel free to comment on the quality of your board of directors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, I've been a fan of Steve for years. He's an absolute champion, so it's a great privilege to have someone with his experience on our board. I was thrilled when he when he agreed to join. Um, but uh, yeah, look, Steve's experience here just you know think think about having gone from building Equinix to to you know forty fifty plus billion. Um, and going through that for a decade, living in the public market, but then going and, and raising an infrastructure fund and now being, you know, operating a, a private equity business. I mean, it's just the, the, the best of all worlds. My view on M&A um, re really is, is academic, and, and, and that is the consolidation in industries has traditionally been driven by uh, scale and cost efficiency. Um, industries get highly competitive, and the way to... Uh, improve economics is to take out a competitor um, and to improve your efficiency, serve more customers and reduce the cost to serve, and reduce the, the operating cost of businesses. What we're seeing is quite unique because unlike ordinary M&A in mature markets, we are barely at the beginning of the growth curve. If you look at what's happened in the course of the last decade, it's an order of magnitude shift. So, what would we expect in new capacity in data centers, in fiber, in infrastructure and platform as a service and security? It will be an order of magnitude larger in the next five plus years. And, and that is a unique circumstance because it means that um, new capital needs to be deployed. You can't buy enough infrastructure and services today to meet the demands of the market. So I think both will be true. But the M&A that has gone on in the industry, I, I think you're...
used to buy in the US. This um, between Corsight, Cyrus One, Interaction. I mean, uh, there's not a lot of public businesses left to acquire. So, um, you know, I, I, we, we've never had more friends um, calling us and tapping us on the shoulder than I've had in the last decade. So, you know, if you're public, it's a, it's a little bit rare air. But I think the idea that, um, you know, private equity and, and sovereign wealth funds can be more patient, they can take time to understand the industry. They're not marked to market in a public um, context, reviewing their investment every day. Um, and they're focused on the long term and they're focused on investing long term capital for great returns. I think those are the hallmarks of, of good investing at the end of the day. Uh, this is a great business. All these guys that are here today are, are in, have built extraordinary companies over the last decade and are still building extraordinary companies and will do something special over the next decade. A little bit of M&A here and there, that, that will be a feature. But what we need in the next decade does not exist today. John, I think one thing that collected, I bet everybody in this room, if you voted, would say that the amount of change we're going to see in the next five years will exceed what we saw the last 20. So all this stuff yep. you put, you've been poking at with us today, mm -hmm. I, I, I would guess we'd all say the amount of change we're going to face in our companies and our industry is going to be more in the next five years than we've seen in the last 20. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, that's a great final set of observations and wrap-up comments. I want to thank you all for your time.